Ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for coming to the day two of the Art Symposium organized by Hong Kong Art Gallery Association in celebration of the Hong Kong Art Week. It is a pleasure that, um, to, to have all of you here um, at the inaugural edition of the Hong Kong Art Symposium. And today, uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce one of our very um, uh, honored member of the Gallery Association, Mr. Johnson Chang, who owns Han Art's um, Han Art Gallery, and he's also a board member of the Asia Art Archive uh, to come up on stage to introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chang. Good morning, everybody. I know you're all very devoted to art to be here this, so early this morning on Saturday. Um, I'm really only here to introduce Anthony Young. Um, on behalf of the Gallery Association and the Asia Art Archive. Um, in brief, Anthony uh, joined the Asia Art Archive in 2006, um, straight from university. Uh, he's still with the Asia Art Archive, so he's a thoroughbred Asia Art Archive researcher and scholar. And uh, we're all very proud of him um, for uh, many reasons. Uh, in 2000. At 2014, he moved to Shanghai, but the same year, he also was awarded the um, Writer of the Year by um, Yishu uh, Magazine. Uh, the Yishu Journal, um, if you don't know, is probably the only uh, English uh, language journal exclusively devoted to Chinese contemporary art, and is a very scholarly publication, so um, it is quite an achievement. And um, he is, he is also, apart from research on Chinese, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, contemporary art, he is also um, a very creative uh, curator and uh, actively promoting the art scene. And he is a co-founder of the Observation Society, which is uh, in an independent art space in Guangzhou. So without further ado, I want to, introduce, uh, I want to invite Anthony to the podium. Thank you. Good morning. Hello. Uh, I want to do uh, two things basically uh, with my 30 minutes. Uh, first of all, I want to give a very quick introduction about AAA and uh, uh, China related research projects that we do at AAA. Uh, and the second thing that I do that I will present you a paper that I wrote recently for a symposium uh, co-organized by the New York University and uh, Guggenheim Museum uh, just last month. Uh, for some reason I didn't make it to the symposium so this is going to be the first time I read this paper publicly. So uh, many of you may already know about AAA but I just give you the basic facts about the organization. So Asia Art Archive was initiated in year 2000 in response to the urgent need to document and secure the multiple recent histories of contemporary art in the region. Uh, it is a loan for profit um, organization and it is supported by uh, art, the art community and also private foundation, private corporations, and also the governments. And as our library is in Hong Kong. It's open to public free of charge Monday to Saturday, which is in Shang Wan is on, on Hollywood Road. We have one of the most comprehensive collections of um, research materials about contemporary Chinese art. Uh, for example, we have um, a collection of uh, exhibition catalogs uh, from the 1990s and 1980s, uh, which is very unusual because many of these catalogs were not uh, official publications. So um, you may not find them in uh, regular libraries or even university libraries. You can see an uh, example of them. And um, all of them are out of print. So, uh, it's almost like primary materials for a lot of researchers. We also have a very comprehensive collections of periodicals uh, from mainland China, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. 
And these are very important research materials for the histories in the earlier times in contemporary art in the Chinese region. And of course, we have a unique collection of primary research materials about contemporary Chinese art. Uh, for example, this uh, Liu's uh, report about the iconic exhibition of China avant garde in Beijing in 1989. We have materials from artists, uh, important performance, uh, documentation, exhibition materials, and also photographs. You can see on the top from left is the Southern Artist Alone experimental performance in 1986, a manuscript of Wu Sanjuan, an invitation card of the solo exhibition of Wang Xingwei in 1996 in Beijing, and also um, a photograph of one of the open studio program organized by Wang Gongxing in Beijing, also in 1996. I mentioned earlier about our library, which is in Hong Kong, uh, but another important platform, probably the more accessible platform of AA, is our website. We dedicate a lot in making the materials accessible through the website, which is www.aaa.org.hk. A lot of these primary materials were made available through the website as long as we settle the copyright issue. Uh, this will make research much easier for researchers from all over the world. So if you come to the website and search whatever you are interested in, you probably will find something that you need. Another very important program that we do about uh, the research in Chinese art is uh, the Robert Holt Family Research Grant that we do annually. Uh, here I'm going to do a little bit of promotion because the 2016 grant we are now open for call. And uh, there will be an upcoming event actually next Friday on the 4th of November in HKU in, in Hong Kong. Uh, the presentation of our last two grantees on um, the APLO Photo Society and also the exhibition Post Sense Sensibility. Okay, so I'll come to the paper. The title of the paper is Documenting Exhibitions in Contemporary Chinese Art During the 1980s and 1990s. So in this short paper, I will ask the following questions. In the history of contemporary Chinese art, what was the role of exhibition documentation? How did ideas, techniques, and strategies of exhibition documentation change? How was documentation used to create a critique, an alternative platform, and a medium for artistic experimentation? And finally, an important yet challenging question, how should researchers today, who have not had the opportunity to experience this exhibition personally, evaluate the influence of the quality and quantity of documentation on our understanding of the exhibition scale, scope, and historical impact? From an archivist's point of view, Huang Yongping's well-known lookbook is the perfect document. Between 1980 to at least 2003, perhaps until today, Huang has been keeping a lookbook with both images and text descriptions, recording in meticulous details his artistic projects and ideas. Written in the artist's lead handwriting, filled with sketches, a selection of images, and systematic editorial arrangements, these lookbooks in themselves can be considered one of Huang's major art pieces. Huang started keeping the notebook in early 1980s, perhaps for pragmatic reasons. After graduating from the Hangzhou Academy, Huang was assigned a job to teach high school in his hometown of Fujian. While he may have preferred to stay in Hangzhou or move to a bigger city, such as Beijing or Shanghai, where, where cultural institutions and art audiences were relatively well-developed, 
he, like most university graduates at the time, did not have a choice. Their jobs were assigned by the authorities, and it was common and maybe not coincidental that so-called avant-gardists in the 80s were sent in the provinces where they lived and worked in smaller cities. For this reason, avant-garde art activities were highly dispersed, or you might say decentralized. And one of the ways these students state collected, even centralized, was through certain print platforms. One of these print platforms was Zhongguo Mei Shu Bao, or in English, Fine Arts in China, to which artists from all over the country would send information and documentation to their activities. Fine Arts in China was a weekly newspaper and one of the most important platforms for information circulation and conceptual debates during the period 19, 1985 to 1989. We paused on the activity of Xiamen Dada, a collective formed by Huang Yongping and his collaborators in Xiamen, were published in the nationally circulated newspaper, as you can see in these photos. It's the first time when Fires in China put information of Shaman Dada. In Wang's lookbook, we see the documentation of a major activity of Shaman Dada. It was a short lived exhibition which only lasted several hours and its name is the events exhibition that took place at the exhibition hall of Fujian Art Museum, a very clumsy title. The exhibition took place in December 1986 and displayed random pieces of junk and construction material. And coincidentally, a lot, resembles the iconic exhibition of conceptualism in Europe and the US, such as when attitude became formed in 1968. This event is of special interest in my research because it injected into exhibition making a new ambiguity. It was one of the first time in the history of contemporary Chinese art where an exhibition was considered as a concept, a medium, and a critique. In a pioneering sense, the event pointed to the complicated and questionable relationship between the authority of the exhibition system and the role of audience reception. Huang's events was a non-exhibition that hijacked an exhibition authority, which is the Provincial Museum of Fujian, that could not and need not be visited. The event could only, and perhaps should only, be understood through documentation, photographs, and textual description. Suggesting that the exhibition is an agency of power and the politics of inclusion exclusion, Shaman Dada's investigation resonated with the concern expressed by the advocates of institutional critique in Europe and the US since the 1970s. In fact, from a letter to Fei Daiwei in 1987, we know that Huang Yongping was very interested in the practice of fluxes at that time. Although the institutional environment in China in the 1980s was very, very different from that of the rest, certain Chinese artists like Huang recognized the exhibition as a hierarchical power structure. Since the finding of PLC in 1949, being chosen to participate in the All China National Exhibition, or Quan Guo Meidan, was considered to be the most important achievement in an artist's career. Participation in this exhibition will ensure recognition by the government and the general public, guaranteeing a lifetime of high social status and income. However, it was also a very competitive, competitive exhibition. Submissions were screened, juried, and approved multiple times by local, regional, and national com committees. And only after the multi-layered rating system would a few works from all over the country be selected for the national exhibition that took place at the National Gallery in Beijing. 
In fact, one of the catalysts of the emergence of the self-organized exhibitions that formed the 85 Li Wave movement was the dissatisfaction with the sixth All-China National Art Exhibition in 1984. It was then that certain ambitious young artists confronted the fact that they may not be possible at all for them to be accepted into these official exhibitions. Arguably, many of Simon Dada's activities since 1987 were reactions to the tendency towards hierarchical power relationships and centralized organizational structure that was also developing within the avant-garde circle itself. Such tendency reached its peak at China avant-garde exhibition in 1989. A historical landmark in the development of contemporary Chinese art this exhibition represented not only the symbolic clash between the artists and the governmental authorities, but also the internal clash between artists and the advocates who attempted to merge avant-garde art into the country existing institutional structure and the others who refused to support the project. Interestingly, the China avant-garde exhibition, for despite all its historical importance, was, in a sense, poorly documented. The best set of photographs was taken by representatives of Tokyo Gallery, who came to Beijing to the exhibitions to acquire works. Therefore, most of these photos focus only on individual works instead of overall institutional views. See the photo on the right hand side is an example from the sect by Tokyo Gallery. The art, another important documentation includes a series of art photographs taken by Wang Yuzhen that capture the unique atmosphere of the event. However, it doesn't seem that high quality in situ photographic documentation of the exhibition was made by the museum or the organizing committee or at least we have not seen them. On the other hand, Fei Dai Wei, a member of the organizing committee, was very conscious about collecting a comprehensive selection of articles published about the show. The question is, does this mean that the organizing committee was less concerned about the actual curatorial planning selection of artwork or, installation, or insta installation methods, and more interested in the response from the public and all the controversies and debates around the event. The current situation of available archival documents may lead us to that conclusion. After 1989, the conditions for exhibiting contemporary art worsened. Self-organized exhibition usually had to take place in an obvious paces and under extreme time pressure. Few lasted more than one day, and unlike the relative press freedom that pervade the 1980s, periodicals and the national print media were strictly controlled, such that their function of circulating information and ideas become less and less important. For instance, Fire Arts in China or Zhongguo Meishu Board that I mentioned was ordered to stop publishing in 1989. Meanwhile, with printing services becoming cheaper and more available in China, art practitioners began using independent publications as a new tool to circulate their activities. Examples include the back of a book from 1994 and 45 degrees as a reason in 1995. These publications formats emphasize concept over materiality in art, and at the same time, avoid the difficulty of financing the production of artwork and exhibition. In my mind, they also continue the radical efforts 
of deconstructing the concept of art that began in the 1980s, such as Zhang Peili's project about X exhibition procedures in 1987 and the tactile art project by Wang Yoshen and Gu Dexing from 1988. By substituting documentation, text, and description of the physical exhibition event and uh, material art object. This is one of those projects that I just mentioned, a publication. It's called Wildlife, Wildlife in 1997. And I think arguably marks the peaks of this tendency. This project was initiated by Song Dong and inspired by his experience of participating in an exhibition called Outside the White Crypt, created by Oscar Ho in Hong Kong in 1996. Wildlife took the form of a catalog that collects documentation of performance or site-specific installation carried out over a period of a year in public or semi-public places by invited artists in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Chengdu. Song Dong has explained in the foreword of the book that the project took such a format not only for the previously mentioned advantages, but more importantly, this project was conscious reaction to the conceptual limitation that the exhibition mechanism imposed on art practice. And I quote Song Dong, the basic characteristic of these activities include the use of non-exhibition spaces and non-exhibition forms, public presentation of artistic practices, and decentralized art projects across the country. This activity thus represents a new departure in our artistic experimentation, end of quote. This is a page inside Wildlife, a project by Lin Lin. In many ways, the project can be seen as an effort to recall the spirit of the avant-garde movement in the 1980s, inviting artists to interact with their lived if, if with their living environment, we introduce the diverse specificities of urban spaces and cultures. We invention of the organic, dynamic, and decentralized avant-garde activities of the earlier decade. The wildlife catalog also included a chronology of events of contemporary Chinese art from 1986 to 1997 that clearly placed contemporary art practice within a long or the recent tradition of surviving as wildlife. However, by then resistant to the standardized white group practice, advocating an anti-object and contest specific practice was becoming widely internalized by institutions both within and outside China. As Wu Hong points out, Ironically, some of the works made for the wildlife project have become later so famous that they re-enter the wide group of galleries and museums all over the world. From the late 1990s, we can see how artists and curators attempted to reclaim the unique time space and bodily experience of the exhibition by emphasizing site and context specificity and multi-sensorial elements. Examples of this exhibition include Trace of, Ex Trace of Existence in 1998, Corruptionless in 1999, the post Sense Sensibility, which is an exhibition series uh, its first event took place in 1999 and indulged with playing in, 19, in 2000. These exhibitions and events can indeed be interpreted as a resistance to the over-conceptualization of art and this content with the exhibition documentation historicization formula. For instance, post sense sensibility, especially its second, third, and fourth events, were decided purposefully to be impossible to document fully. Although some photographic and video documentation is available, 
one can only imagine the excitement, bewilderment, uh, or even apprehension of visiting these exhibitions. Going into an abandoned factory in the suburbs or a hidden room in the basement, being surrounded by hundreds of people in the opening event that might be the exhibition's first and last moment, seeing large-scale works that emit smells, sounds, and provoke other sensual experiences. Like a walk concert, these exhibitions were about being there. Photographs or description are not able to replace the experience. These exhibitions sought to re-establish physical and direct interactions with the audience, thus creating a new locality that distanced itself from the way Chinese arts were being represented in international exhibitions. As Feng Boyi, the creator of Trace of Existence, said, I quote, Although Chinese artists are often placed in international spotlight because of the continuous insistence of socialist ideology and attitudes toward art in the minds of Western creators and the power that be, their work is still not really able to communicate within, uh, with the Western audience. When we began planning this exhibition, which is the chase of existence, it was with the hope that by placing art and this exhibition in a Chinese social environment, it could be the start of something that would grow and could be nurtured independently in China." End of quote. Exhibitions like post Sen Sensibility, Chase of Existence, Indulge with Pain, and others that were organized during the late 1990s and early 2000s form an important chapter in the history of contemporary Chinese art. And while this exhibition responded to a specific intellectual context at a specific moment in time, they can continue to offer important inspirations to artists and art practitioners today for their experimentation and critical spirit. And at the same time, these exhibitions profoundly challenge our dependence on photographic and textual documentation in, con in conducting historical research. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, um, Anthony. Um, does the floor has any questions? Thank you, Anthony. That was really informative. Could you please elaborate a little bit more on the research techniques at AAA? You know, how you and your team conduct research. I know you travel quite a bit, you collect a lot of data, but how over the years that sort of research team has evolved? I mean, I think now you guys are very, doing very sophisticated research, and it would be interesting for people here to understand more about that sort of day-to-day -day research operations. Um, so um, our research methodology is, uh, as I call it, a very pragmatic one. Uh, we, um, our ultimate purpose is to promote and encourage um, research on contemporary art in Asia. So um, unlike a typical scholar, I actually don't often write paper like this. I only write this paper when I'm invited. So uh, what I do is, uh, of course, we build um, collections of materials that um, is generally considered to be important. Um, how do we decide if something is important? Of course, we have an um, academic um, advisory board, which we constantly communicate with, including Johnson and other very respected scholars. So we, we um, find uh, research trajectories that are important and interesting to people. Uh, we also keep co co close contact with uh, young researchers from universities around the world, so we know that what people are interested in, and we develop um, archival collection around these um, directions. Uh, we, um, we also develop tools for research, like bibliographies and chronologies and things like that. So we promote, um, uh, in a way, a, a basic structure that a younger researcher can rely on. 
So what we do is really like um, the first level or the primary levels of research that can be uh, further developed by researchers from all over the world. We open up trajectories, but we don't usually go into a certain trajectory very deeply in a, in a way. So we, we suggest, we got very excited when we hear about researchers interested in certain things, so we encourage them to go deeper to those things. Yeah. Um, I would like to ask a question, Antini. Um, yeah. we were, I was really enjoying and learning from you about the documentations of the exhibitions uh, up to 1990s. Um, how has it been progressing since then until now? I mean, generally, um, like 2016, how, how, is the show, how are the shows in China documented and exhibited differently? Thank you. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, in about the... Um, mid 2000s or so, um, the institutional environment of China has changed a lot. There were a lot of, there was a much, much bigger market. There were much more um, organizations that started to establish since the mid 2000s. So uh, a lot of research and uh, documentation was done um, in the level of organization. Unlike before, it was a lot of exhibition was self-organized and people have to do, uh, do documentation and curatorial uh, work themselves. Now with uh, galleries and organization, they take care of the uh, documentation in a, in a new approach, in a more systematic approach. Of course, there are new problematics around that, but the situation has changed quite a bit after uh, things were more striven by the organization instead of the individuals. Yeah. Um, any more questions? If there aren't, then thank you very much, Mr. Anthony Yong. Thank you. It's our pleasure. And we will have a lot more exciting program. You just have to take a break and we'll get ready. Um, it will start at 10.55. Thank you.